Welcome to Get After It with Nashi, brought to you by Ace Property Management and Sales. Yeah. How have you found it so far? Have you found the book before we start? Nah, well, no, I'm putting this in. The book is, I've read a lot. Of, you know, I'm a big fan of military guests on the show, and in turn, I read a lot of military books. But what you've got here, and you know this, and that's why it's doing so well, um, sort of before the launch and everything, the way you've documented your year in training, I've never read anything like it. It is really so, wow. It is, wow. It is so interesting the way you've done it. And then obviously mm. with your um forensic psychology degree to back it all up. Yeah. And you've put, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've put real world environment living the, the Royal Marines life into something me as a civilian, as a dad, can sort of take these methods and implement them into my life. That's incredible, mate. It's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's got to be obviously what you were hoping for, but the fact, yeah. the fact that I'm reading about what happened to you on day 64, 2 a.m. bed, up at 4 a.m. cleaning, I wish I was at home. You're so honest. Mm. And you've actually, yeah. you've actually written down exactly what the hell you were feeling like on day 36. <laughs> uh, yeah. Day 36, yeah. 21st birthday, wank. Had a shite day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, tell me, I know a bit of the story, the background, but to, to the listeners, it was your mum that gave you this diary as you were heading off for, for training. That's right, mate. Yeah, I, uh, the, the, the 20 year old me and, and previously to that would never have even considered doing this or, yeah. or anything. Uh, my mum's slightly a bit eccentric and just, a, I wouldn't say out there, but she is a bit a bit out there and she just before I got on the train she'd give me this diary and just said look just write things down uh I want to know what you've been doing and uh I think if you do it it'll it'll help you at times uh and I kind of took it reluctantly and just thought just bizarre like weird uh and I got on the train and then on the way down it were almost like I was like going down to the gallows. I'd already been down there on PRMC three weeks ago, a uh, potential Royal Marines course. Uh, and I just felt this like real like rush of adrenaline and like uh, like we're on a roller coaster, like I put in, in the book that I couldn't, I'm strapped in. It, it sets off and all of a sudden you want to get off. That's how I felt. So I took, I op- I just opened the diary just and just thought, you know what, I'm just going to write down how I'm, how I'm feeling. Uh, and that's what I did. I just said, look, I'm, I feel like I'm on a roller coaster. I'm, I want to get off, but on on the other hand, I'm I'm really really excited to be on this journey. And it just started this train, uh, this chain reaction where I just absolutely felt compelled then to keep it every day, and that's what I did. Have you have you, have you been aware of anyone else doing a similar thing and being so consistent as you were? No, no, no it's as it's, it's never been done before. I think people have 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 attempted to do it or. And this is not taking any way, anything away from them, but I think people have attempted to do it or, or they've, they've liked the idea of it, but nobody's ever, nobody's ever seen it through or done it. And what were your, your pals, your friends like? When they, were, you, were you doing it in secret? Were you scribbling away in secret? Were you, were you quite open about it? And were the boys ribbing? Yeah, you? I mean, I suppose amongst the lads, when the training team weren't there, I wanted to keep it to myself a bit because I didn't want the the attention, uh, but uh, I, I think it were, it were an open kind of thing that I were doing it. Uh, the lads couldn't really understand why I were doing it or anything like that, or or understand my rationale at the time. A few actually said as it got further on into training that I could potentially make it into a book, but it never crossed my mind, mate. It was never something that I thought one day I'm going to turn it into a book. I, I, I would just I've always had like OCD. Uh, I'd say quite bad. But it's always been more towards the uh, the perfectionist side of it, mm. uh, as in like the, the attention to detail. And I honestly think that without that, this would never have been possible. Because once I started it, I had like this underlying guilt every day. If I got to the end of a day and I and I hadn't done it, it were like it were always always on top of me. Just like it would be if you had to pay a bill on a deadline. That's just how it felt. Uh, but the training team, they were just, 
I mean, on my 21st birthday, which you've just read, they ripped all my cards up uh, and just said there's like there's no birthdays in here at all. Uh, so I honestly thought that based on that, if they ever saw the diary, they'd rip it, rip it to pieces. So I kept it really, really quiet. Uh, and then one day uh, they found it and they were like, what are you doing? Uh, and I told them, and you know what, mate? They, they were just like, this is hoofing. It's brilliant. Uh, and they really, really supported me and backed me up on it, which which I think their endorsement was superb. And it just allowed me to then take it in the field and waterproof it and uh, and, and be, in a sense, a bit open about it. What about me? You, you document your honesty, your truth. You, you talk about how anxious you were when you're sort of looking ahead, but you also seem to break down days. You're looking at a faraway target, but you would take it a day at a time and accomplish what's in front of you. Some sort of yeah. highlights, bits and pieces that I've picked out already, like your tattoo, RM. You're doing, yeah. the, you're doing the press ups. What is that like when the the instructor instructors get on your back when they get on your case, and you're thinking, yeah, oh, fuck. Oh, it's just, mate, it's just, it's just horrendous. I mean, the first kind of one of the memories that I've got about the first time that I went into the gym, and it might have been on PRM, so it might have been at the start of training, but I can remember there's lined outside to go in to the gymnasium. And then all of a sudden you, you're like, you're hurried in and it's like, come on, come on, get in, get in, get in. And you put your water bottles down and then you just met by this physical ferocity of the PTIs, which could, the, which could be like anything from maybe like four to six or eight, whatever. And they all run at you and they're all like correcting your body language and your body positioning and giving you like, real in, intense abuse and it's just an unbelievable in, intimidating environment where it's that shocker capture I think is what they're trying to simulate and it works you, you just feel completely out of your comfort zone and I can just remember like in the midst of it while it were happening I looked up and there's a sign on the wall that I think it's it says Royal Marines Gymnasium uh, and I can just remember looking at that and just thinking this is going to be so, so tough. It's going to be like unbelievably tough to to reach the end. And I, I suppose you, you, you just never know that you can do it, mate, to be honest. You're all, are you constantly doubting yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I call it in the book like the daily burden of failure. It's a journey that you're on that you just... I mean, I went in and I just thought, I'll see how far I can get. Any amount of weeks in there is going to make me a better person. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to kind of find myself to establish my identity. Uh, but yeah, it's a daily burden of failure. You can, you can, you can get injured at any point. You could get a stress fracture accumulated over a period of time through impact. Uh, you can fail on a particular thing. Uh, you just, you just, it's, it's just one of them things in life where you don't, you can't have full confidence that you can do it until it's done. Uh, and it's, that's just an incredible piece of engineering that they've done there, really. Yeah, but in, in that uh, press-up challenge, when they've said, take your tops off so they can see your chest hitting the guy's fist, and you know you've got RM tattooed on your back, yeah. what were you thinking? Yeah. You, yeah. Were you thinking they might not see it, this might not get picked up? Tell everyone what that stood for and what the instructors Yeah, did. sure, sure. So... So my granddad passed away, who were like, like uh, I really, really looked up to him, like a father figure. He was called Roger Monks. Uh, so I had a guardian angel on my back, and just at the base of the guardian angel, I had RM. I didn't want Roger Monks because I just felt it were a bit too generic, what everybody were doing. So I just put, I'll just put some subtle uh, initials under the guardian angel that mean something to me uh, and only me. It kind of backfired when we went in the gymnasium because the PTIs were like, right, everybody get your fucking tops off. So I took my top off and straight away I knew that they would put two and two together and come up with six. Uh, and they were just like, when I took my top off, I like put my me, me, me head down like a child would put his head into a corner or into a dark room thinking that he can't be seen during hide and seek. And it was very, very childlike what I did. And uh, 
I just heard this PTI just say, like, what is that on your back? What is that? And they were like, hey, come here, have a look at this. And it was just like, again, just like being at school, if you're getting bullied and and you don't want the attention, but you're going to get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was just it was just like that. Everybody just raced over and they were all very American in style, just all in my face and just giving me, just giving me abuse and just saying that, this one, the PRMC on the select three day selection, they would just say, no matter what I did, and this one day one, and they had two more days to go after, no matter what I did, I was going to fail uh, because of that tattoo. Uh, and I really tried to uh, give some rationale for it as to why I had it, but it just went on deaf ears. They just were not interested. Uh, and they were just saying, we absolutely guarantee that we're going to fail you on this. Like, who, who the F do you think you are? And it would just. Yeah, it was it was just an awful, awful thing. And then every every I was still there at the end, but every time with every waking morning, uh I didn't know if if, if my efforts were in vain because I just thought at come the end of the selection, when they have I suppose my performance evaluation, they're just gonna turn around and say, uh you know, it you, you feel, failed because of that. You're right. Yeah. Yep. I mean that that absolutely. It's so interesting the way that they get into your head, they get into your mind. But I, I like the way you described one of them. He had he had muscles on his ears. I mean, he's just a, a big, yeah. gnarly man that is just going to come in yeah. and scare the shit out of you to try and just put you into mm. the, the places that you've never been before. But I also read and I've heard that yourself, when someone drops out, that almost motivates you. I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps you going. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a bit like social comparison theory in psychology where you measure your success against somebody else. That's the only way that we can measure success uh, by comparing ourselves to other people. And, I, and it, it, it might seem quite harsh and brutal, but every time somebody drops out and it happens really early, I mean, people dropped out in the first couple of days in the first week, whatever, but every time somebody drops out, you like think, First and foremost, I, w- I just used to think like you're really weak. That empowered me. But also I just thought, I'm nowhere near going to quit here and you're quitting. And it just made me feel like you just, it, it just gives you a boost. It's quite incredible, really. And what they used to do is, and this, they probably still do it now, is they have like the original troop photo of all the people that started. And when anybody leaves, they scribble the face out in permanent marker. And just seeing these recruits getting uh, scribbled in black, just a massive lift uh, mentally on on your journey, really. It's a, it's a hard thing because in life, away from the Marines, away from the military, you don't want to see people fail. You don't want to see people fall behind or, or lose something that they've worked so hard for. But we do see that. And, you know, some people can be nice to your face, but behind your back, they're hoping you fail. You know, yeah, absolutely. We people out here, oh, Gaz has got a new book out, ah, but to your face, Gaz, the book's great, all that sort of stuff. How have you taken that into real world life where every man and woman can sometimes have people failing around them and they get a little pick up when it actually you can't show that you can't show that someone else's failure is encouraging you to keep going, but in the military, you're fucking he's out, I'm going. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird mindset to be in because we want people to do well. But yeah, yeah. Crashing and it's a strange. Yeah, it's. A, it, I think training's. It, it's quite a strange one, really, because you need the collective to be successful. And I think the message in life in that is is that no one person's achievement can be a, attributed to themselves, regardless of what it is. You need the help of others uh, and the selection of your team. And how I suppose successful that team is, and how well you've picked it. And by team, I just mean your, I suppose your social surroundings. It does facilitate your success or your failure, and uh, you do need the team. But I think your plight in the Marines is a very, very, in a sense, individual effort. You, you've, you've, you, it's all in your head, uh, and all confined to your head uh, and your mind. And uh, 
you've you've got to rely on yourself. You've got to find yourself, and you've got to find what what your uppermost capabilities are, but also what you don't like. The, the, everybody's got limitations. Uh, I think you find out the innermost aspects of, of what you like and what you don't like on that journey. But but yeah, it's it's it is a strange one. It's a strange one now. We uh, we we almost we like to see people fail around us while we succeed. I don't know. I don't know where that where that kind of comes from. But it it, it, it happens. Uh, yeah. I, 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 and I don't I don't say that I want to see everybody fail. But I think when you're on the same journey, I think that it's a competitive edge that you kind of need that ruthless side of you. Uh, I think it's possibly down to competition and, and, and being selfish. Sometimes being selfish. And, yeah, 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 and and I suppose it. This the set it, the culture in the Marines is, is is very much kind of adverse to that to being selfish. You, you just can't be selfish, or you will not succeed. But at times you have to be. I think you have to harness a, a bit of selfish selfishness at times uh, on any kind of journey to 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 achieving something that's worthwhile. You yeah. you just gotta kind of be like that, and I think probably that's an aspect of it is 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 seeing people that are probably not up to task, not capable of doing it, and you do you do get some empowerment from it. How how did you get to the stage of where we are today with the book? Getting it to this position because we talk about teams. I know there's rugby league, there's the Marines, but even at the back of the book, you're acknowledging the team from Hordards. You know the team that are around you, the people that are in your world now. It's a new team for you. How did sure, you get, how sure. did you get to this point of twenty year old recorded the diary, been all over the world, had ups, had downs, becoming a dad. Now the book's out, and you had to forge your way because I know from from your story you, you got. No responses from publishers. You got no thank you, this, that, and that. You kept going. And here we are. Yeah. I've got the book here and we're talking about it. What's that journey been like? How did you get to here from the time you wanted yeah. to write a book? Yeah, so, I mean, as I got older, it became kind of like a a, a thorn in my side that I needed to bring this to life, this, this account. And I think over the years, there's been many documentaries, some good, some bad, but predominantly they've never accurately represented just what it's like at Limston if you haven't been there and I always felt that like more contemporary documentaries had really sold that journey short uh, sorry that that challenge that endeavour short and uh, I started writing over maybe the last 10 years and lost the work and then started writing again and lost it and then just kind of Never were able to get the consistency with it because I were I were doing other things. I were in private security and whatnot. And then I got a a, a ticket from my old from my old CEO that that uh, was to go and see Tony Robbins at a weekend in London, a convention. Mm. And I went, and although I mean he, he absolutely blew me away. I thought it were an absolutely incredible uh, event. Quite weird in parts. But it was it were good, and but one thing he said really resonated, and that was that there's something in your life that you you know you should be doing that you sat on, uh, and he says I just want you to write it down and I write it down, and from there on in I made a uh, a kind of commitment to myself that I was going to have a real serious crack at the book, uh, and I left, and that's what I did. I, I wrote all the diary entries up in six months, uh, and then from that, mate, I didn't know what to do. Nobody tells you what to do. Uh, I'd like I'd got this book. I'd got what I thought was the book, the spine of it, uh, as it is now. I didn't know how to publish it. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. It's almost like I've always kind of likened it to this. It's easy to put hot sauce in a bottle, but how do you put that on the shelf in Tesco? How do you do that? Mm. It's just it's it's it seems impossible, and that's that's kind of what it was like. And I. Uh, Anyway, I, I managed to speak to somebody that said, listen, you need to get the Artists and Writers Yearbook, which was, uh, it's like a big red book that's like thicker than the yellow pages. And inside were loads of literacy agents, but each has got a different genre. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all want different kind of submission uh, packages. Some want a, a cover letter, some want uh, first three chapters, uh, a business plan. 
So I sent off 50 tailored submissions. I got literally no response. And at that point, you start thinking, am I just one of these people that are, that go on Britain's Got Talent that think they can sing? Uh, but, they t- but they can't, they're terrible. So you start with this battle, this like, this real writer's anxiety of, am I good? Am I not good? And one, one minute you can think, God, what I've wrote there is a masterpiece. You wake up the following day and read it and it's like, that's terrible. And you're in this battle, but then all of a sudden, I managed to get a literacy agent uh, and he looked at it, he said, amazing, I love the title, we've got something. But he didn't say we're going to represent me, but what he did say was he said, you need to add in 34, not 34, but you need to add in lessons after each week. Uh, and I said, on oh, what? And he said, just lessons that the reader can use to enrich their lives. And it just, the timing of it felt that I'd just finished my uni uh, in forensic psychology. So we're able to, I think, psychologically and forensically break down each week and form a psychologically grounded lesson from key point of that week that the reader could use to make the life better before, uh, and enrich the life. Be, before you met that publisher or the person that gave you the good advice, were you re- were you letting friends and family read it, what you'd done already? Were you getting constant, this is amazing, this is good? Did anyone say, this is shit, that you actually respected their opinion, but you had to forge on? Did anyone sort of stop you in your tracks and be brutally honest to the point of you were getting... Positive, 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 bang. Oh, didn't see that one. Mm. You know, because your friends and yeah. family will always tell you you're 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 brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course they will. Especially my mum would yeah. like she could read she could read anything and say this is absolutely cracking, but but yeah. Uh this is the thing, mate. So I didn't feel like I didn't I had any internal integra- uh, sorry, internal uh credibility being an author so I didn't really want to pump it out because I was scared that people would be like yeah cheers mate and so I kind of like kept it under my own roof but I let like my a couple of close friends read it the love the diary entries which I were quite surprised about they they said we can't put it down we just I've read I've read the whole thing in like two or three days uh and that, like, I was thinking, bloody hell, I've, I've potentially got something here. But it was, it was still really raw. And, uh, but yeah, it was all, from who saw it, very positive. And I know that that's probably, well, it is a biased approach because the people that I did show it to, they're not going to turn around and say shit. But it, it was, it was very well kind of interpreted uh, and received. Well, I mean, but it is though. It's a page turner. The way you describe your days and the way, you know, the the way that I can I can put myself what I can put myself in the place of what you're describing, you know, mm. and the way you say I didn't want to I didn't want to go or, you know, this day day fifty six exercise day one, it's it's simple. It's well read. I can understand what you must have faced. I can see it. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. watched enough movies. Yeah. I've watched enough SAS. Who dares wins? All these sorts of things. But to actually see it and for you to be so honest about things, how shit it was at some points. And mm. then you just had to turn mm. up the next day and how hard yeah, you struggled. Yeah. That's what I think is yeah. incredible in there. But even as you talk about your forensic side of it, when you look at the chapters, these are right up, you know, mental resilience, recruit Nero, fatigue and burnout, staying motivated, losing sight of the end goal. I can understand all of them from a business prospect, uh, business side of things yeah. of where I am you know, in, in what I do day to day and there's the end goal and you can find yourself two months into a project and think, fucking hell, I'm way off track here. And mm. in the book, you're giving your methods of what you had to do to get back on track. It's, it's valuable. Yeah. It's really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I think, thanks a lot, mate. I really appreciate it. I think, I think what I wanted to do throughout the book would just be really, really, really honest. Yeah. Uh, and show vulnerability, which is in the diary. I've said in the diary entries that uh, I don't think I can do it. Uh, I fail at certain things. There's times when I say that I'm a, a fizzbiff, which is somebody that's not very good at physical exercise, which is really frowned upon in the Marines. And that's just because I, 
I didn't conduct myself very well on my leave periods. And then I went back fatigued and and, and not well rested and paid the price for it. And uh, I just wanted to be really honest. And, and I think there's so many other pieces of literature out there that, that like be giving you stuff, but it's almost like it's coming from a place of the person that's giving it is the perfect product. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to show like the real, it, it, what you're experiencing, the setbacks that you'll have and, and what you encounter is all expected. It's all, they're all, they're all natural pulls on life that, uh, that everybody experiences. The trick is, 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 is kind of getting through it and getting past it. And I just wanted to just really relay just some pragmatic approaches to, to, to the lessons really and, 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 and ground them in psychology that everybody can understand. But it's, it's what cements it even more for me. And when readers get into it is the way you recovered from the disappointment of rugby league mm. and the way you went off the rails the way you were headed yeah. to prison, the way you talk about the Marines saving your life. Yeah. That, that is heartfelt. That is pretty deep. There's a lot of people with similar stories. Yeah. But, but to have given up everything to chase rugby league and be in the yeah, league, yeah. to be in the Leeds Rhinos Academy, getting the contract and this, that, and there, and saying, nah, that's not for me. I'm not being taken serious here. I'm out. And then yeah. finding your way to the Marines that saved you. Yeah, I, I can yeah. I can relate a, a touch. I, I said no to a pro pro deal at Edinburgh Rugby many many years ago. It wasn't wasn't for me, you know. Mm. And it, it was in the papers that Nashi re, uh, rejects or says no. It wasn't necessarily a money thing, but it was more about I don't know. I didn't want to do it at the time, and I never turned pro. Mm. I played all the age group stuff. So when I was reading your stories, I can relate to that. You got further than yeah, yeah. You got into um. The lead rhinos with some now their household names back in the day. Yeah, um, yeah. incredible. So, so incredible. You might I don't know if you I don't think from what I've read that there's regrets there for you because you found your path, but that was an incredibly mature thing to do as a young man to say no. Yeah. And and with your yeah. dad, with your dad on your shoulder saying, son, you need to be a rugby player. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. It's it took some getting over, did that? Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 you know what? I don't think I got over it until I were in my thirties, early thirties, literally, really, really recently. I'd been kind of groomed to play pro rugby, uh, and mentally kind of geared up to to not have a plan B because plan B meant that you were not committed to plan A. Uh, and like I've said, I mean there were quotes all in the house, a quote above the toilet so so that I read it when I went went to the toilet and stuff. And just a really professional and kind of focused environment that I that my dad's house at one point in my life, in my mid teens were really geared towards. And I always viewed rugby as a failure. And there's an aspect to me that still does. I can't put it to bed. However, it's really true what you said, mate, and I'm glad that it kind of comes across in the book that my worth was more even at that young age I felt like I, I was worth more to myself and not money wise but in terms of treatment and I've always kind of had that kind of conviction really where no matter what I've done and I kind of I had it in the Marines when we came back from Iraq where as soon as that value drops or I, I don't get what I think I deserve and it's not Deverish or anything like that it's what I feel I'm worth I'm willing to walk away from anything uh, I'm, I'm just willing to walk away and even at that young age I think I was maybe 16 17 when when I walked away and it was massive it were absolutely massive me and my dad's relationship really struggled for two years after it uh, I could have gone to any other club but I just didn't want to uh, and I've, I've said it were almost like, mate, discovering once I'd left that the 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 world were flat, and and I, like the Truman Show, and I'd only just and only just realised, uh, and that's kind of how like significant and profound it was on my life. And going for the Marines were a massive, massive gamble. It's not like just 
oh, I'm going to join Marines. It's the, the risk in that endeavour were massive, but it's it's what I threw myself into. And I think had I have failed at that, it would have really reinforced all the demons that I'd amassed at rugby, especially upon leaving Leeds. You see, as a dad now, how do you view father fatherhood? With your, am I right? So you've got a little boy. I have, mate. Yeah, yeah. You've got yeah. A, how how do you view fatherhood now? I mean, you've been through the the highs of a young sport in life, achieving a lot very early, but then you had pressure from from your dad. You had pressure as a yeah. you know as a as a young kid, as a child. Yeah. You know, to, to, yeah. To do what dad wants you to do. How do you view fatherhood in that and bringing up your boy? Mate, it's a great question. Uh, and ultimately, I, I have completely changed my approach to it. I, I held so much resentment from, me, from my dad from that. He, he, he didn't parent me and nurture me properly. He gave me no advice on anything. Uh, it would just rub me on off him. And when I fell out of kind of the rugby thing, he was kind of living his dreams through me in retrospect. And uh, I'm just really, I just still feel quite angry at him for it, even to this day. Uh, it's a really sore subject that normally, if we do have have words, it normally always comes up. And now it's changed me now moving forward is, is that I just put no pressure on my son whatsoever. And whatever he does, is into, is in, he loves his rock climbing and... Uh, kind of like looking like he's going to go into ext- extreme sports like I, I don't know like uh, BMXing and uh, and that kind of thing and uh, whatever he wants to do I will be there to support him but I certainly won't push him into a line of uh, a line of I suppose approach that only benefits and interests me for my interest uh, it, it's completely I think made me so well round as 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 a father, really. I tell you, I I admit this. I find it really hard at the side of the football pitch, watching my my boys. You know, because I'm wanting <laughs> to get up faster. I've just got to walk away. I think it's millions. Yeah, it's not overly natural if you're not like that. If you're not enthusiastic, especially if you've got a sporting background that you're quite fit, healthy, active yourself. But what I mean, I I can't fault my parents. They were very supportive of what I did. But rugby was a route that I chose and I wanted to play it when I was at school and go on from there. I ne- didn't necessarily know how many other cool things were out there. I, yeah. Until I met my wife and she introduced me to water sports and long distance running and all these sorts of things. <laughs> it's crazy yeah. now that my boys play football, my daughter does the dancing and the bits and pieces, but God, my daughter loves surfing. I never surfed until we moved down here at the East Coast. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Incredible yeah. now seeing what's just what the ki- your kids can do. Everyone mm. thinks my kids will go into my boys and maybe Scott will go into rugby. You know, when they were born, yeah. people gave them rugby ball. Yeah. And here's a rugby yeah, yeah. For you, man. So, oh, great. Yeah. It's good. You probably prefer a surfboard. It's funny how yeah, yeah. things evolve that you don't see coming. It I is. Don't any of that coming. It is. It is. And you know what? What I did learn from it is, is that no matter how much investment my dad put into me, and no matter how much he absolutely was hell-bent on me doing that course. Ultimately, I had the final say and I made the decision to leave and there's nothing he could have do about it. Mm. So, and I I, th- I always went on to do what I was going to do. I think I was always going to go into Marines and, and like, I wouldn't change a thing now because where I am now with the book and the journey that I've been on, my rugby career will have finished now. Uh, long ago and I'd be left pondering on, on on what to do kind of going skillless really in a sense for for, for the outside world and uh, yeah I just think I, I, all the investment that my dad put in uh, were kind of wasted and that must be tough on him and I just think that no matter what you do People, your kids, are the, their own singular person and they will do, they'll go on to do whatever they're going to do. And I don't think you can kind of shape that in a sense. 
what what is the relationship like now when you get your green beret your very accomplished royal marine commando it, it, has he got respect for you of what you have achieved and how you've got a direction in your life and you you achieved something great yeah he has mate yeah we uh relationship got better when i went to marines and uh i think as i were on that journey now we're getting closer and closer and we, we started with 51 lads and there were 11 originals left at the end. And every time I phoned up towards the back end of training, he'd always ask me, like, how many's left? That were like his thing. He wanted to know how many were left. Uh, and he would just... The same kind of effort and enthusiasm that, that he put into me at the rugby, he then displaced onto me and the Marines. And he, he were really, really happy uh, and, and, and kind of really proud and... I think since then he's always the the, the power dynamic shifted. He he, he put he, even now it's like he he, he kind of looks and he, he sees me as as the relationship's not great between me and my dad. It's weird. Mm-hmm. It's really weird. It's almost like he's really proud, but he's also got some jealousy, and and it's it's really sad. It's really sad, uh, but. There's nothing I can do to, to kind of change that. Uh, no, it's it's, it's, a, it's it's a one-way thing. It's interesting what you touched on there because leaving the military and leaving professional sport can be a real hard transition. And I've, I've worked with quite a few rugby players and try to help them, whether it's getting to my industry in the property world or a reference or review, come in, come in to me and we'll do some interview training and all that sort of stuff, however I can help. But yourself, and I can see you've got Fortitude Elite, Kit on, you've got not point one projects. You've got you've got a lot going on along with the book. I love the not point one percent because ninety nine point nine percent need not apply, and you've just taken yeah what that not point one percent is to make it, and you've put it in your book. Yeah, but what is this culture that you've created? What does this brand, this business mean to you? To to have people like me wanting to speak to you, that people are coming to you saying, "How can I get this edge from you guys?" Because I want in. How does that feel and how is the business evolving? Yeah, it's it's absolutely incredible. And it's like, it goes back to your question about the book, mate. What's it like looking at that? I've, I've not seen it yet. When you, when, you, when you sent me the picture, that was the first time that I'd, uh, that I'd seen it. Yeah, yeah. Look at you. Uh, Look at you. I know, I'm there. Look, I'm there. It's, it's incredible, tweed. yeah. You've got the tweed the napkin. Yeah. Oh, I've got it all going on, mate. Mate, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's good, mate. It's great. Yeah. Honestly, it is a page yeah. turner. But no, yeah, they just just the way you've now got a, you, you've built a future. You know, yeah, we're, we're coming yeah. at the military well, could be no man's land, and you've built something that is is here. Who knows? Is there going to be more books? We don't have to get into that. But you've got a platform now to build, to develop, yeah, and go from. Yeah, you, I always said to my mum, uh, and whether this is the moment, I don't know. It's, it's quite hard to, to 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 know when you when you're in it, but. I've always kind of said to my mum that I'll do something that'll be quite significant, that I'll, that I'll in a sense, make it. Uh, and what that means, I don't know. And by making it, I don't mean financially. Uh, for me, it's always about the accomplishment. And in a sense, I think a bit of the title. I'm not really bothered about amassing wealth quickly. Uh, but I've always been really, really keen on business and I've always been very entrepreneurial uh, and wanted to have my own business, but I didn't want to just do any old business. And this has kind of organically happened as an offshoot from the book and not point one. It just made sense uh, to call the clothing line that, uh, and it's gone mental. Uh, it, it's just gone really well and everybody's, and I'm just so happy that there were a few publishers that came in for the book at the end uh, and they pitched to me, which were an unbelievable turn of events. But uh, some of them wanted to make the book a bit more commercial, like the SAS lads, uh, and I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't change the business plan. Uh, and then it went through the MOD, the book, and, and I just thought, the hundred percent not going to like this. The, the detail that's in the diaries, but they signed it off, 
Uh, and I'm just, I, re- I were really uh, kind of pivotal on the on the front cover as well. Working with the publisher, they've been fantastic. And I've just got, I think I've got a product that I'm absolutely delighted with. There's not one part of it, not part one fortitude elite and and the book that I'm just so grateful that it that it's that it's here now and that I've had such a a key hand in it and it's it's everything that I that I wanted. And my philosophy is, just quickly, is is that if you if you just inject attention to detail into into what you're doing, into the book. Uh, that that's that's the business. That's not point one. Yeah, well, you, it's you just talk, attention. To, is it is attention to detail? Well, you talk about the small things and the attention to detail being building blocks to the bigger end game. You talk about that in the book. Yeah, and yeah. It, it is these simple things that can be so easily overlooked. And it yeah, can, so I don't need to do that, or someone else will do it. But you know, it's there, and and you've got through your career doing breaking things down to day by day or mission by mission or however you've done it. And I think in yeah. any walk of life, when you're looking for that, I don't know, promotion, when you're looking to change jobs, you're looking for to get into the first team. Little things, yeah. incremental steps, yeah. working on this, working yeah. on your pass, working on your kick, one at a time, getting better and better. That's and then it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Results come and the, yeah. the evidence is out there. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it, yeah, absolutely. And it's not, it's not that I've, I'm living this life of, of absolute, daily perfection and, and 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 I've got it all right it, it it's it's doing it right more often than you're doing it wrong mm. and, I, and and I think I think that's the key you're gonna have days where you're having a bad day but the consistency is not about always being on the upward trajectory it's just about turning up every day and just reenacting the same behavior the same kind of winning mindset and same successful mindset to wanting to get better than the next than the, than the last day and I think that's been like an investment for the last since I was a young boy it, it is that and it's just starting to pay off now and, it, and I think that could be the message to anybody is just just keep going just keep Keep turning up every day. And if you do that, it will come sooner or later. It's, it's, I'm just starting to see the fruits of that now, your, which, is, your testament, your testament, which has been worth it. Guys, that leaving rugby and, and even know, knowing how your career progressed to the military, when it wasn't for you, you got out. You, 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 yeah. you were prepared to leave what you knew, to leave the career comfort in finance probably a secure salary and say no nah, time's up what's next I'm out you know and you you, you did that and it, rugby to military and that can be so frightening for people that can be so daunting that they get stuck in doing something or they don't start that project that might get them out of the daily grind one day yeah and you've done it you've done it yeah. you, you know working something every day and you've written something that we can take home, we can read, we can listen to an audible, we can we can understand what you did and when you drew the line in the sand to say, fuck that, I'm out. I'm going to take a risk. Yeah. I'm going to take a risk yeah. and I'm going in that direction. What was that transition like when you left the military going into private security? I know, I got time shooting on, but Somalian pirates, you name it. I know you've got a hundred stories, a million stories of just, just risk. You know, you, you took a chance. You yeah. Took, you found your feet and you kept going. Yeah. So it, it, I always kept a real kind of foothold in civilian life. And I never I never bought into military life as such. I could see that it was kind of a tool to institutionalize people and keep them in. Uh, and I didn't buy into it at all. Uh and I quickly kind of came to the assumption that once I were in that, I wasn't going to do a long time. I was going to do me uh, and, and use it as a stepping stone to get onto private security. And that, that, that's, that's kind of what I did. And uh, I had a real itch to scratch doing hostile CP, close protection. 
Uh, and again, I, I, I kind of applied for for three years trying to get in and it was really tough to get into. And then after three years, I kind of got a job offer in Iraq and one in, in Afghan. The reason why I chose Afghan was is because uh, when th three, uh, three of my mates that went through training that are in the book, they got killed in Afghan and it really, really rocked me. And I kind of, in a sense, I lost a bit of my edge and Afghan scared me to the point where I was quite reluctant to go. And when I left, I couldn't live with myself for having that kind of mindset on it. So I just thought, I need to put this to bed here because if I if I don't put it to bed, it's going to haunt me and I'm going to have regrets over that method of thinking and that I suppose that behavioural output. So when Iraq and Afghan came up CP-wise, if you could call it, but Iraq were the softer option and Afghan were the more, certainly the more hostile option and had the most risk. And I just thought, you know what? I can't live with myself if I don't go and put this to bed. So I chose Afghan CP and I went out there and I did want to be in the thick of it. There were a part of me, but there were also a part of me that was scared to death of going uh, because my cloak of invincibility had been kind of shattered when the lads got killed that I knew. Uh, but yeah, I went and, uh, and, and, and just kind of got on with it. But, I, I think it is a story of, of, of kind of taking risks, but it's that old cliche, and it? You, 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 you've got to take the risks. You've got to get out there and, and just... The key is, and I think the fundamental factor that underlies it all, is, is stepping out of your comfort zone. You've got to step out of your comfort zone, and as soon as you do, you experience certain levels of adversity. Uh, some people experience adversity that everybody experiences instantly when you come out of your comfort zone and they jump back in and they live a life of comfort. But in that life of comfort, no opportunity comes and you can't get what you want. Uh, and I'm quite happy being in adversity in order to, I think, get to where I want to be. I was impressed that when you first applied for the Marines, I'm taking you back in the Marines here, you failed. You failed on maths and you had to wait a year. Yeah. You had to wait a year to get back in. You could have yeah. gone... You could have gone mental during that year, yeah. keeping a job, yeah. just gone on easy street, you know, and thought, fuck it, tried once, I'm not going to go again. But you stuck yeah, to yeah. it. And then you got in with a, a, a ruptured cruciate or your, your knee was jacked yeah. up. And you kept That's going. right, mate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I failed on maths and then I got a got like a maths tutor that, that gave me private tuition for a year. Uh, and I, I'm, as a result now, I'm like really good at maths. Uh, which for me quite incredibly and I absolutely really love maths I, I really really enjoy it uh, and it were an ample part of forensic psychology which is mental but but yeah and then I had asthma uh, and eczema uh, and then I'd ruptured my cruciate ligament and my knee used to dislocate and the three of those things were like massive showstoppers on that and I just asthma and eczema I just felt look I've been born with this and that, that's not a disability because I had no that I've been born with that. Like, I'm not having it. I'm not having that. That is detrimental to anybody else that ain't got it. So, I, again, I kept that really quiet. Uh, and luckily managed to to get in. And then, yeah, with the knee, I just thought I'll get as far as I can and uh, hopefully get past week 15, I think. And uh, they'll keep me in. They'll rehabilitate me. But it was a massive, massive gamble. And it, it, it dislocated twice in training. Again, I kept it quiet and, unbelievably got all the way through as an original and got to the end with it, which is just mental. That's crazy. What, what, what are your thoughts on what's going on just now? I've seen you put out some social media stuff on Afghanistan and you'll have friends or maybe or colleagues that are maybe out there at the moment or, or they're back now or, or you're familiar with it. You've been there on close protection tours. Yeah. Like that. What are your thoughts at the moment of what we're seeing unfold? Yeah, it's it's absolutely tragic, mate. And I'm not just saying that because that's what everybody wants to hear. But uh, obviously, I spent a year in I spent a year in Kabul, and when I were in Iraq as well, I had the same kind of the same kind of thoughts as the feelings as well that you put in a plaster over a gaping wound. Uh, 
the 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 Afghan National Army, the, the governmental forces, they because there's no culture of education in Afghanistan, we were training them, and the 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 radio communications engineers were training the Afghan National Army how to use radios, and it was classroom based environment, and they were all fast asleep for the session, so they never really learned anything at all in that year. Uh, just completely not interested. So that's a an element to it. But uh, I think the, the the most tragic part of it, and there's there's a few, but I think two that kind of stand out is is the fact that friends died and people lost limbs. Yeah. And you've got to look. I mean, I were only speaking to Ben Reddy's mum yesterday on on Facebook, and she was saying, look just devastated, absolutely devastated, and rightfully so. And I'm sure Tom Curry's mum and everybody else's uh, parents that have lost somebody, just wondering why, what, what what were it all about? So there's that, and that's that's kind of stuck with me for the last couple of days, which I'm quite surprised about, because normally I'm, I don't really give it much, I do, but I don't really dwell on it, and I have dwelled on it. Uh, and then I think... They've already started whitewashing things, women on billboards uh, and and making, I suppose, men grow beards and stuff. And it's absolutely tragic because when we were there and we were dealing with interpreters, they were just saying that they just they were scared to death of the Taliban coming back. They were scared to death that the Americans would just leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what's just happened. Yeah. Uh, and I just think it's absolutely tragic. However, maybe this were always going to happen, but I think, as in the Taliban, were always going to come back and, and regain power. But how they've done it, I think, is is just absolutely terrible. Talk about uh, the end game of foreign policy. It's just, it's just, it's tr- it's absolutely tragic. And when you're seeing all these desperate people trying to get onto airplanes, I saw a picture of two people falling off uh, a plane that had taken off. It's, it's absolutely terrible. So, so there are people trying to get on the planes and escape rather than stop the planes. You know, they're, they're actually scared. They're, they're yeah, not, yeah. They're not the outside of planes. Jeez. Yeah, they, they were clambering on and, and they'd, they'd gotten to like the, the arches of the wheels yeah. on this uh, on the C-17. And as it, I mean, you could see them mate, like they're just grabbing onto like little panels on the side and you're just like, that's never, ever, you're never going to stay on that. No. Uh, and it's, it's gone up and then it just, it shows you just some footage of them literally falling, falling down. And it's, uh, the desperation is just unbelievable. It's, it's and yeah, I, I just, I'm fascinated by it. I'm so invested in it because when I went in the Marines, that kept me in training because I knew I was going to go to Afghan, even though I didn't go in the Marines. And then obviously the lads got killed. Uh, and then I went doing CP. So it's kind of been a really, really, uh, a real significant part of the last, I think, 15, 20 years of my life. So it's seeing it how it also all unfolded is unbelievable. Yeah. And from close protection like that to the, to the pirate ships, to the, fighting against the Somali pirates and things like that. What was that like? Was that I had Jordan Wiley on, who's obviously a, is well known for the Somalian uh, pirate security protection. But what was that like for you? What was that um, experience like on the big, the big ships? Yeah, I fell naturally into it. Uh, I'd done FSRT, Fleet Standby Rifle Troop, in the Marines, where you do non-compliant boarding. It's like a specialist kind of job, working in six-month teams, and. Uh, when it kind of kicked off, I got a call and just said, look, you need to phone Orlando Rogers up, who, who, who was just set Solace up and see if he'll get you out. And I phoned him on Monday, went out, went down for an interview on Wednesday, Friday, I flew out uh, to kind of Somali Basin, uh, Indian Ocean, and stayed out there and it was incredible money. Uh, and then, I mean, we, we, we got the biggest pirate attack Uh I think around that period, really, the biggest in, in in 2011, there were four of us and we got attacked by 11, 12 skiffs that just came to kind of hijack the vessel and 
uh, we just ended up engaged in a in a contact for about 35 40 minutes and yeah it, well the it, well the the one period in all of it where I thought I was going to get killed uh, and coming to terms with that realization and having to kind of dwell on it for quite some time was well, really, really tough. But we we, we won the arm wrestle uh, and we repelled the attack. And uh, it, 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 the whole thing, Maritime, when it first started, were really enjoyable. You were, I'd gone from being in Civvy Street for a bit uh, when I left Marines and then I went out and, and kind of got back into private. And I went back around the lads and being around the lads and hearing how the lads talked and using the Marine slang and, it were a lovely, like a, like we just put a warm jumper on. It were, it were nice. Did those pirates get on the boat, or did you manage to keep them off? They didn't, mate. No, they they, they came in with. Uh, I looked through the binoculars. I'd run up like fifteen flights of stairs. I were having me dinner, uh, and the lads radioed me and said, "Guys, you need to you need to get up here quick." And I knew straight away. I just, I picked the the, the vessel up in Malta. Went through the Suez Canal. Uh, and the vessel vessel were heavily laden with iron ore, which were insignificant, really. They're not bothered about what's on it. They want the, the captain and whatnot. It's a bit of a misconception, but it meant they had a really low freeboard of about five under five, five metres or under, which meant you could step onto it, uh, and it only went eight knots at a push. Mm. Uh, so it were a massive, massive target. And the, the, the standard operating procedures were that all weapons had to be locked in weapons boxes, on the bridge wing. But I just had this gut feeling, mate, that uh, we were going to get bumped, we were going to get hit. So I had I got the lads to keep the weapons out, loaded on the bridge wings, which massive no-no, would have got sacked instantly for that. Uh, but it, it came in useful because we got hands on them instantly when we needed them. And I can remember just looking through binoculars and seeing them these coming in and I just knew from the angles that they were cutting that it was hostile what they were doing uh, and as they got a bit closer look for binoculars you could see them with the weapons up in the air and RPGs and uh, I was just like hyperventilating like <gasps> like that fight fight and flight and I put this that were in the original manuscript the original book that there were a period when I looked through when I just I flew instead of fighting. In my mind, I flew. And uh, I was just thinking we need to surrender quick to preserve any percentage of life that we've got. Uh, and it was really difficult coming to terms with how I reacted to that because I didn't want to react like that, but that's how I did naturally, only for a couple of seconds. And then I kind of got this sense about me that we couldn't negotiate with this with this situation. It was very much uh, unnegotiable. Uh, and I just then kind of slipped into autopilot that the training that we'd had and stuff. And we fired warning shots into water. They came straight through it, which really, really shocked me because the the, the sound of it and the how the, the water and the splash were just incredible. And then they started firing back and it... it I've got there's an I've got an audio of it still, uh, and I just say to the lads like get the fucking rounds down, uh, and we just started like laying down re 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 retaliative fire and uh, over a period of time it wasn't visual but I just got a sense that we were starting to win the firefight we were starting to get an edge and they were coming on from all different sides so like getting one lad to run from. Uh, port side to starboard side lay down fire and then getting him back to lay down fire on starboard side it was just chaotic mate okay, I was dripping wet through and but I, I've I could like a, a drop of sweat dropped off my nose and it hit like the steel structure and I could like hear it me me my senses were so attuned to the environment it was incredible uh kind of a, experience and feeling that I had never Again, the old cliche. Never felt so alive. It was it was it was unbelievable. And did the pirates? But yeah, the, give in or eventually? Did you kill them and you gave in? Or the, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, they give in. They uh, we they, they they fell away. 
that, that fell away and there was some that uh, I think that had fired back and we engaged them and uh, there were nobody in the boat. They were all, okay. some of the lads said they were all on the deck. Do you know what I mean? They were all, the boat were bobbing, but there were nobody, no longer stood up in it. You you could just see a bobbing boat. And that's that's all we could see, but it were, yeah, it was just mental. And then we sailed off and uh, apparently the, the, some of the militia in Somalia had put bounties on his heads and said that because we'd wiped out like kind of so many that they, they uh, they'd put like 10 grand bounties on his heads for his capture. Mm. And it were on the front of the Somali newspaper or whatever that kind of, what that is. That's, and, uh, that's yeah, five, five minutes of fame. Is that what they call it? <laughs> five, five minutes of fame that you don't want. <laughs> yeah. What was the captain like? Was the captain grateful and all the guys? What, what... Oh, mate, he was just... Uh, all the ship's crew were Burmese. Uh, the captain was super bloke. Really, really great guy. Firm with his crew, but with us, he thought we were heroes. And then when we did that, uh, it was funny, mate, because he threw a, he threw a he threw a party for us. Uh, <laughs> a couple of days after, he went right. We're having a party, a big party. We're going to get the chefs to put on a big banquet, and we're going to crack open the 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 bar, the, the bar, and we're going to get all this booze in, and we're going to like we're going to get fucked up. And uh, there was a strict no drinking policy, but it were like, we've just done this and why not? I mean, I didn't drink because I had reports to do and whatnot and and I just didn't want to be rough for that. It wasn't me being good, but I just didn't. But So I went to this party. Everybody's getting like really pissed and stuff. And then the following day, the lads were like really, really rough and like shaky, like beer fear. Yeah. And I was like, what, what, what's what's going on what, what, what's happened they went oh no no just just every night every night the ship's crew said then that the lads had called naked bar so the captain and all the crew and everybody's like walking around the ship naked <laughs> <laughs> sleep back in the rugby club yeah like mate it was just rugby club antics yeah uh, and, and and I suppose what what happens when you get a load of load of lads together that are, that are pissed and stuff and uh yeah, it was just it was just absolutely class, mate. Yeah. Really, really good. But yeah, unbelievable experience that. Unbelievable. I, I honestly thought that initially at the start that we were pretty done. That was it. Well, guys, it's been awesome. We could sit here and talk for hours, but the book, what is your hope for the book? Because is this the kind of thing that could, well, it is. You could give it to new recruits. You, I mean, it could, what's your hope for it? What's your ambition for what the world you're in now? What do you hope the future holds? <laughs> Yeah, I would. I would love it. Obviously, clearly, to do really well. Uh, I mean, I've put so much time into it, and I think it's the appeal to it and, and what it can do, as you kind of alluded to at the start, is, is very universal. It will absolutely help all recruits, uh, not only going for the Marines, but the Paris and the Army, the Navy, the RAF, and international as well. But also, like you said, I've wrote it in a way that you can pick out the lesson. You can deconstruct it. If you're savvy enough, you can tie it in with what you're going through. Uh, and I would just, I would just, I would really love it to become a piece of literature that is like, you need to read that. Yeah. There's certain pieces of literature that there's like Malcolm Glad Gladwell outliers, uh, uh, thinking fast and slow and all stuff like that. I would love it to kind of, if it would be, if it could get into that realm, which I genuinely, free from bias, think it, it should be now, uh, based on what what I've done with it, I'd be delighted with that. I'd be absolutely delighted. Yeah, mate. Well, here I think it. I think it's going to do great things. It is. It's very relatable to a guy that doesn't have the military background, but for somebody that's on the edge or parents, even if my if my kids said I want to go into the military, I'd be saying, yeah. look at this. This is what you're going to be up yeah. against. Yeah. Yeah, it's and that's what I'm. That's what I'm most proud of. Really, is that uh, I think finally it just offers a a real, real raw and accurate insight into what it takes and what you will go through if you don't go and do it. Yeah, guys, good on you. Where can can people get it yet, or is it still pre order? Or what's the what's the state of play? Yeah, thanks, mate. It's uh, it's it's pre order. It's pre order at the minute. Uh, 
I mean, you can pre-order it on WH Smith's, Waterstones, Amazon, uh, Audible if, or Kindle. Uh, just all book and online mediums at the minute. It comes, it, it, it gets released uh, and then goes into all kind of notable and credible bookshops on the 26th of August. So 10 days to push on pre-order and then 26th of August, which is next Thursday, uh, you're good to go. You can get it in Waterstones, WH Smith's going to be in all airports. Uh, and as well as Australia and New Zealand, so amazing. Yeah, well done, mate. Well, here, good on you. Uh, I'm going to keep in touch. I love following your um, your social profile. What's that on on Instagram? Because there's a lot of military fitness, your clothing brand. You got tons going on. What's the the sort of call? Yeah, so I've got. Uh, I suppose the one for the book, which is which is which is mine, really, is becoming the 0.1%, 0.1%, and then there's a uh, at 0.1 projects, which is the clothing, uh, like. Uh, extreme uh, sorry mate you there got you yeah 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 which is extreme uh, kind of like CrossFit based clothing but we're looking at like essential tools like uh, camping knives and uh, prior bars and stuff Uh, and then Fortitude Elite which is the the pre-military performance stuff that we do so that's at Fortitude Elite uh, and and yeah, and then I've got obviously W uh, website which is not dot uk. So yeah, hook me up there. Awesome, mate. Well, guys, take care. Thanks for everything. Wish you all the success with the book. And here, let's do this again sometime because um, I want to hear how it all goes. And you, you know, a year down the line, I think you'll be on to good things, mate. Yeah, thanks, mate. I really appreciate it. it's been a, it's been a pleasure joining you, mate. It, it really has, and and. and I can't thank you enough for inviting me onto onto what you're doing. I think it's it's fantastic and really appreciate it, mate. Good man. All the best.